Good morning, everyone. I'm really honored to be speaking here today. This year is my first time at a Nazis conference, and although it does feel like a loss not being able to meet all of you in person, I must say that I cannot think of a better year for this gathering. It has been you cartographers, the ones that have helped the rest of us navigate our way through this unexplored 2020. Personally, I have relied on the COVID map created by John Hopkins University to know how my loved ones are doing in Boston, China, and Mexico. I've also increasingly uh, been thankful for the different platforms tracking the California, my current home. Uh, they've been tracking the fires and I have been evacuated twice. And if it wasn't for purple air, I would not know when to leave my house. So before I go any further, let me just say thank you. You, in a way, are silent heroes. Cartographers and people building cartographic products are playing an essential role in helping governments, companies, and ordinary people navigate this crazy year. But my appreciation of cartography and cartographers didn't start during the pandemic. In fact, my interest or obsession started when I was 10 years old and my dad took me to a flea market in Mexico City, which is where I'm from. He showed me an old map of Mexico and I could see that the sepia color prints we were looking at were very different than the official map that hung on my classroom wall. The northern border wasn't at the Rio Bravo. It extended all the way to Oregon and to the south. Belize and Guatemala were part of Yucatan. My dad explained how the same place looked differently when it was depicted by different people. Most of the maps I had seen so far of Mexico had been made after the Spaniards invaded, but he taught me about Aztec maps and documents, which are called codices. The maps I knew showed coastlines, mountains, rivers, and lakes, but Aztec representations of places included people, suggesting that we can only understand space in relation to how people live in it and move. Of all the maps my dad showed me, there was one that made a lasting impression. It was a map of an island in the middle of a lake. He explained to me that a long time ago, the flea market where we were standing used to be underwater. Mexico City, Mexico City or Tenochtitlan had once been a shallow lake. That changed my understanding of my city, and it taught me my first lesson about maps. Not only are they instrument for exploring space, they can also be time machines. I didn't dwell more much on those impromptu history lessons with my dad, but something must have stayed with me, because when I was a teenager, I always gravitated towards books that center around maps. Detective novels where the clues were hidden on a map or a story about a wizard that explored different kingdoms. Again and again, maps seemed to seek me out. Like many of you here today, I am from that threshold generation who had only ever seen maps in books or in walls, but who stumbled into a new parallel universe in their late teens when the internet became very popular. In, late night explore, in, a, in, a, late, in a late night exploring the internet, I came across the incredible Perry Castaneda library map collection of the University of Texas. And for the first time ever, my imaginary voyages were traced among pixels rather than paper. From my mother's house in Mexico City, just a few blocks away from where Frida Kahlo once lived, I traveled to countless distant places through the Castaneda maps. We couldn't afford to travel in real life, but those maps took me to Ceylon, Batavia and Cathay. I long to explore all these distant lands. Many years later, those dreams came true and I reached all these places. I traveled for a month in Sri Lanka, I lived for a year in Indonesia, and most importantly, I ended up setting shop in China. China was my home for over eight years, and it was there that I transformed my interest in maps into a profession. Traveling in China can be daunting, especially if you don't speak Mandarin. So I developed a series of travel guides to help non-Mandarin speakers get the inside scoop on Chinese cities and give them a way to visit food stalls, bazaars, and street markets where Mandarin was essential to order dumplings or haggle with stall keepers. This was in 2006, 
before the smartphone era, before we all had GPS in our pockets and Google Translate and text-to-speech. To create these guides, I spent hours walking the streets of Beijing and Shanghai. I carried three different maps that I bought at a local bookstore and a series of photocopies that I downloaded from Google Maps. Back then, the very concept of an online map was entirely new. At least, it was to most of us. Most of us. So I marked my photocopies with an orange pen and eventually created the map we would publish. I had no theoretical background in cartography, but I knew that to draw a map, I needed to walk each place and memorize it so my understanding of a city could make sense to others. The map was one piece in the puzzle of making Beijing and Shanghai easy to navigate. Another was a set of cards on which Chinese phrases were written. These went well beyond the stock phrases most guidebooks provided. In the restaurant section, for instance, we handpicked the best dishes at each spot. One of the restaurants we recommended was called Spring on Jinxian Lu, a tiny street in the middle of Shanghai. Locals flocked to its neon lit interior seeking the best Shanghainese, Shanghainese dishes in town. The menu was handwritten on a piece of paper, making it impossible for non Chinese speakers to order food there. One day, I passed and saw that a couple of foreigners were using my travel guide. Seeing my vision turned into, you know, something real gave me a real rush. Whenever we select information and make it possible for outsiders to understand it, even if we don't speak the same technical language as others, we are acting as guides. In this sense, map makers are curator of experiences. The people who decide which locations are displayed on a map on how they are displayed have an enormous responsibility. We decide how people perceive places and project them. When writing a niche travel guide, that responsibility was little more than an afterthought. By selecting and including a place, I directed a handful of tourists there. But when I started Tierra, the company that I currently lead, that sense of duty became central to my thinking. After years living abroad, I returned to Mexico in September of 2014, ready to start a new endeavor. I had sold my company and I had some ideas about creating a media app. But my plane landed in Mexico four days after 43 students had gone missing in the south of Mexico, probably victims of four disappearance and police violence. To this day, nobody knows what really happened to them. This horrendous event made international headlines. Ayotzinapa, as it became known, touched a nerve. It touched a nerve because it wasn't an isolated incident. Violence and crime have become universal, systemic problems in Latin America. Just about everyone in the region has been a victim of violence or knows somebody that has been eaten, either robbed, kidnapped, or even murdered. I felt after seeing this reality that I needed to do something. Living in Latin America sometimes feels like walking in the valley of death. It's home to just 8% of the world's population, but it has one third of all the murders in the planet. In 2018, for example, 48 out of the 50 most dangerous cities in the world were in Latin America. In Mexico alone, eight people disappear every day. By any account, Latin America has become the most violent region in the world. But even though I knew my surroundings were dangerous, that danger felt very hard to pin down. I instinctively knew that some places were more dangerous than others, but there was no real way of comparing them or grasping how these abstract statistics related to life on the street. Surely I thought there had to be a map that told the story of which areas were safe and which areas weren't safe. And I looked for one, but found nothing. There was no map or site that tracked when and where, where crimes were happening in the country. The biggest problem was lack of data. Despite how shockingly high these statistics might seem to you, the actual only reflect 8% of the total number of crimes committed in the region. The rest go underreported. I started digging around and was surprised to find that the few maps that did get uh, uh, some information 
you could see that the information was only aggregated at the municipal level and had no uh, specific date. As a result, when you mapped crime data in Mexico, you couldn't really see temporal or geographic patterns with any kind of granularity. This reinforced the feeling that we were living in the shadows. We knew that things were happening around us, but we didn't know exactly where or when they were occurring, or whether there was any pattern to them. What made this state of affairs particularly astonishing was that, unlike when I was developing a travel guide in China, by this time, smartphones were everywhere. If you think about it, we could order food, get transport, watch movies, or track the stock exchange anywhere in the world from our phones. But what was interesting is that in Mexico, you couldn't know if the street corner you were standing on was safe or not. The gap between what was needed and what was available was huge. My first thought was to create an application to crowdsource information. Rather naively, I thought that by relying on people volunteering data, we could solve the problem of underreported crime. Waze was just taking off and it seemed obvious to try to replicate something along these lines. Little did I know, or I knew at the time at least, that people don't interact with security information the way they interact with information about traffic. Eventually, and more importantly, I realized that a lot of these applications mapped perceptions and not actual incidents. The kinds, the kinds of things that people report are corners where teenagers, mainly poor or brown teenagers, are drinking, smoking, or just talking. Bias was also what informed the way most people around me understood danger. There was a pattern. When Mexicans said with a lot of authority that a place was dangerous, it was because it was poor. When I inquired further as to how they knew it was dangerous, the answer was always the same. Everybody knows. By this point, I had already learned that maps represented time as well as space. And I had also learned that creating maps came with a great responsibility. My third and last lesson was that everyone has a map on their own head, an understanding of a place that they use to inform their actions. Unlike many other people in the startup space, I did not want to be in the business of reinforcing biases. So I looked for a better way to approach the problem than crowdsourcing. I joined a university research team to understand the problem of security data in greater depth. I discovered that there was much more data than I first realized, but it was siloed into countless databases that weren't aggregated, clean or standardized, making it impossible to compare and contrast information. I hired a researcher with an incredible understanding of where all this information could be found. Mara Roldan, a true wayfounder when it comes to navigating the intricacies of Mexican bureaucracy. She mapped out the information for the very first stage in our journey. Once we had gotten the lay of the land, I realized that all the lessons I had learned from maps over the years applied to these new projects. I needed to create a crime map that would help users visualize not just where, but when were crimes happening. We needed to understand both temporal and spatial patterns. Creating a map like this came with huge responsibility. This time, I wasn't just directing a handful of tourists to a place. This time, I would potentially be branding a place as dangerous, and there was no precedent that showed how that label might affect the lives of the people living in these areas. Finally, this map would challenge how how many people understood the relationship between a specific place and risk. So the science behind it would have to be robust enough to change the existing preconceptions. In this regard, we moved away from most crime maps. We decided to create a risk score and not a heat map. We did so because through a number, we can capture not only the density of incidents, but also the severity of each crime and the population density in a given area users are able to understand in an instant how safe an area is based on the ranking. If you want to hear more about how we build the risk score, Anthony Sardan from our data science team will be presenting on the panel Mapping for Society this coming Friday. A few years into our journey, Tierra is now a team of 15 people and our interactive online crime map is now fully operational in Mexico. 
we've built the largest database on crime and violence in Mexico. Instead of creating anxiety or amplifying prejudice, this is a map that empowers our users to navigate their surroundings and keep their team safe by understanding what is really going on around them. Right now, our users are companies and governments, but we hope that in the not so distant futures, consumers can benefit as well. I would like to end today on a personal note. Tierra tells a painful story. It's a story of loss. It's a story of loss of property, loss of GDP, loss of freedom, and above all, loss of human lives. Our team knows that. In the face of so much pain, and when our daily routines are immersed in a world of shadows, we think of ourselves as rebels. We refuse to accept this dark reality as our destiny. We're building Tierra to map our way out into a brighter future. Is that idealistic? Perhaps. But you, more than any other audience, can understand the transformative power of maps. So it's only fitting for me to make today's journey a circular one and return to where I started by thanking all of you for helping the rest of us make sense of this messy year. Thank you. <laughs>